Welcome back to the studio guys and today I'm going to be having fun with Barry Sachs mouthpieces. So in particular this is going to be a hard rubber baritone saxophone mouthpiece showdown. So to my left here I have a massive array of mouthpieces all shapes and sizes. We've got high baffles, low baffles, different sized chambers and I just thought it'd be a useful exercise to play them one by one straight after each other so you can hear the intricate little differences and subtleties between them all, all the little nuances if you like. It's very useful having reviews on the website, giving descriptions, basically explaining that they're all good at doing particular things, but sometimes it's more useful to actually have them be played in front of you one by one against each other so you can really hear those little differences. So I'm just going to broadly take you through what I've got on my left here so you can get a, an overview. So we've got um, a Selma S80, very sort of standard mouthpiece there. We've got a Francois Louis, a little bit more specialist. Um, this is a 305 opening, so quite wide. Uh, we've got a Jody Jazz HR. We have got a Drake uh, crossover in an 8 tip, I believe. I've got um, an Azen LS mouthpiece. Uh, and I've got a Van Doren B7 mouthpiece. Uh, a Jody Jazz, which one is this? That is the Jet. So a much brighter mouthpiece there. Um, I have a BL5 Van Doren mouthpiece. I've got a Yanni Gazawa hard rubber, a Maya hard rubber, and finally a Link hard rubber. So there's quite a variety of different sort of tonalities and approaches to baritone sound there, um, from the more sort of regular sounding pieces like um, I would imagine uh, the Otto Link um, and the Maya and Van Doren perhaps, to slightly more sort of extreme, um, bright and sort of projecting kind of mouthpieces such as the Jody Jet. Uh, so that's a bit of an overview. I'm now going to try and play something consistent on each one so you can really hear those differences in a sort of more scientific way.
So there we are. Sorry if that was a bit tedious for some of you, but hopefully for others that was perhaps a slightly useful exercise. And I had a really varied experience trying all those baritone mouthpieces, as you might have heard from the audio and perhaps some of my physical struggles and in other cases some of my joy as I move from one mouthpiece to another. They're all so contrasting, even though they all look much the same lying down here on this white box next to me. So I'm just going to take you through some of the highlights and lowlights of the mouthpieces to my left. I started with a Selma S80 Seastar, which is generally considered quite a sort of classical mouthpiece really. Um, but for, for me on baritone, it's actually just a general pleasant all-round sound. I mean, a C star is not going to give you massive projection, but because the baritone is such a big sounding instrument, it, it did sound reasonably big to me. Um, and just in terms of some of the, the warmer, more all-round sounding mouthpieces, I'm just going to pick out a few. Right at the end, I played an Otto Link um, this one's a seven star, so a bigger tip than the Selma S80. And I've always been a fan of these for just a good all round warm baritone sound. For example, if I'm ever just doing some general testing or perhaps a, a baritone video, I might choose one of these because I know that it's a, a nice safe bet. So I don't know if that came across to you guys listening there. Um, the Mayer for me, I played it just before the, the Link. It's made in the same factory as the Link, and I've always seen them as sort of quite similar in terms of the, the modern versions of these. I struggled a little bit more with this one. It felt a little bit edgy to me in comparison to the warmth of the Link, for example. Um, some other nice sort of warm sounding mouthpieces. Um, I really enjoyed the, uh, where is it, the Azen, yeah, right in the middle here. This had a lovely, fat, uh, sort of silky smooth sound, and it felt like it controlled the tone better. Um, incidentally, I was trying to play a sort of B-flat major scale type thing just because I could lean on certain tonalities to try and enjoy the tone or in some cases not enjoy the tone. So uh, that, that was the idea for doing that, that I could end on a, a bottom B-flat, which is a, a nice sort of showcase note on the baritone, and I sort of hit the top D. Um, again, it can be a, a note that can be a bit weaker on the baritone in terms of trying to play a singing melody. And on some of these mouthpieces, you could really express that top D it could sort of come out of its shell, and on others it was very muted. Um, and I felt that the Van Doren uh, Optimum, where is it, it's down here, um, was a very sort of muted sound. Uh, obviously very much a classical piece, and you have to treat it differently to the others. Um, but it, it was interesting because in terms of the order of the mouthpieces that I played here, it came straight after the Jody Jazz Jet, which was extremely bright and kind of parpy. And then I moved on to this, and it was quite a shock to the system. I had to completely readjust my kind of psychology and thinking and, and the way I set up for playing it. But I couldn't really project on this. Um, and I think it's, it certainly has its use and that's pro probably more classical quartet playing. Um, so it didn't produce much volume, but the, the way to project on a mouthpiece like this is in, in more of a sort of subtle nuanced way as opposed to just producing bags of volume and projection. Um, so that, that was interesting. I think it would probably do better taking a different read, perhaps at a Van Doren, slightly harder read, giving you a bit more resistance against the, the smaller tip opening. So that was the optimum, a little bit of a struggle for me there. And then just talking about some of the louder mouthpieces, I just touched on the jet. Um, you can almost hear the individual vibrations as it's going da-da-da-da-da, particularly on those bottom notes, um, because it's got such a baffle in it, so contrasting to some of the others. Um, also in the louder category, we had the Drake, um, and uh, yeah, this has got a very um, high baffle and very powerful, um, but also quite an enjoyable tone as well. It's going to produce certain styles of music really well. It's not going to work in a classical quartet, for example, um, but you imagine playing in Tower of Power with something like this, you will definitely come across. So I had a lot of fun with that one. Um, so they're the two really kind of uh, loud mouthpieces out, out of this hard rubber selection. Probably another day I'll do um, a mouthpiece video involving the metal pieces because by and large there's going to be a higher percentage of, of kind of uh, uh, bright and powerful mouthpieces there. It's generally the way they seem to be made. Not, not in every case. There are some darker sounding metal pieces. But out of this range of whatever we've got here, 10, 12 hard rubber pieces, th those are the two that stand out as being 
um, with plenty of projection and, and uh, volume and kind of pop behind the sound. Um, but if I had to perhaps point out a favorite out of all these for, for my general style of playing, um, I would just come back to, to this one again, the Azen, um, one I mentioned earlier, just for being a good all round beast. Um, it had a, a good big sound. I always like to produce a, a big sound on any instrument. Uh, but it had a sense of control and it just had a nice tonality to it as well. And it worked across the range. The top end was nice and smooth and the bottom end, uh, bottom end had a nice uh, um, sort of full fat vibration to it. So there you have it. That's, that's my conclusion. I'm sure you're going to have your own conclusions and I look forward to seeing those comments down below. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was a bit of fun, maybe tedious for other people, but for those where it was appropriate, um, perhaps it was useful for you. Thank you.